Algunos ya. I am proud to shut down the government for border security. Five billion dollars for a border wall. The Democrats have made clear they're not budging. The federal government now officially partially shut down. Just so you know, we're building the wall anyway. They say that progress has been made with this. The U.S. government faced its longest shutdown in history due to a standoff over the funding of the border wall. 800,000 federal workers aren't getting paid. With an estimate of 400,000 people attempting to illegally cross the U.S.-Mexico border in 2018 alone, this leads us to ask, why? Why are so many people willing to make the extremely dangerous journey? They face extortion, kidnapping, rape, and even black market organ harvesting, yet they're still coming in high numbers. How bad would life have to be to make you pack up and leave everyone and everything you love behind? Clothing, socks, anything like that? Also, it's possible like underwear, uh, socks, okay, especially cool. men. We met with an organization called Border Angels to get a closer look at what's going on. Border Angels is a migrants' rights organization that runs a shelter in Tijuana, Mexico for deported migrants. They're also well known for dropping water in the desert along common migration paths. In order to get a better understanding of what it's really like for migrants on the ground level, we went down to their shelter in Tijuana. We are with Hugo from Border Angels and he's going to be showing us where we're gonna be sleeping tonight. Yeah, so we are here at the Migrant Embassy, a shelter, Embajada Migrante. We are sheltering uh, 41 migrants in total. And there's how many people sleeping here? Two, four, uh, six, eight. 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 And how long do people usually stay here? Some of them three, four days, but uh, many of them stay here for more than two months. And for the most part, is this everything they own is here? Yeah, everything they own. You can see this, these bags, you know, there's their belongings, their clothes, with a pair of tiny shoes, and they have their back of hygienic products. And that's it. For the ones that sleep here, they when they wake up, the first thing that they see is the, the wall. Oh, there's two bathrooms. Two bathrooms? Yeah, but uh, they are in really bad conditions. Two bedrooms like this, eh? Mm-hmm. Donde? Fine. How long have you been here? About two semanas. This is also part of the, of the shelter. He was deported two years ago. And the first time that he tried to cross the border, he, he got a one, one month sentence. He was in a detention center for one month. The only reason that he was deported because he went to pay a ticket. And then he was, he ice, you know, he was caught yeah. by ice. When it, he has tried to cross the border <laughs> for five times. Yeah. And all the time he has, he has been caught. Even the border patrol agents yeah, have patrol, said yeah, to yeah. him, you know, because, you know, he said, he tells his story that he has his wife and kids in, in the States. And he said that even the border patrol agents say, hey, just keep trying. We're going to try to stop you. Yeah. You, you, you have to try to, 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 to make it. In the case of the ones who are just, um, you know, deported without, mm -hmm. you know, a, yeah. a kind of a tough issue. They say, you know, keep trying. The downstairs rooms were full, so we went upstairs, where some people sleep in closets. Even those were full. We decided to take our sleeping bags and set up on the roof. Since Hugo warned us it was a foggy night and migrants were planning on crossing, we decided to keep our cameras ready. In the morning, we had to start a series of interviews that would truly wrench our hearts and bring us awareness of dangers that we had only heard about from afar. Even Hugo himself has an extremely powerful story, but we'll let him tell that later. 
Many of them are Central Americans uh, that are asking for asylum. They want to present in front of the Border Patrol agent to be processed as an asylum seeker. Asylum is the legal protection the U.S. offers to people who are in danger for a variety of reasons, and you have to be on U.S. soil to apply for asylum. Of all the family units apprehended at the U.S. border in 2017, 80% of them were from either Guatemala, Honduras, or El Salvador. These three countries are known as the Northern Triangle. And the single reason so many people are fleeing these countries is simply the violence. For example, a person is 16 times more likely to be murdered in El Salvador than in the U.S. Gang activity is so bad in these countries that people see no other choice but to make it to the U.S. soil at all costs. Hugo then introduced us to a 12-year-old kid named Jimmy, who was born in the U.S. When he was a year old, his mother Daisy was deported back to her home country of Honduras. She took Jimmy with her. Daisy had bought a house with her life savings, only to have the house itself stolen from her by local gangs. They were forced into another part of the country, and as Jimmy got older, another gang was trying to recruit him. Opting out of a life of violence, they fled from Honduras on foot. They're now staying in Mexico on a humanitarian visa at the Border Angels Shelter. Estando en Honduras, compramos una casa. Mi esposo tenía dinero y compró una casita de 100 mil pesos. Ahí al tiempo llegaron las pandillas, nos quitaron la casa, todo. Desde ahí entonces me vine así, abajo, abajo. Sola trabajando con Jimmy y luchando, pero siempre juntos. Nunca nos hemos separado, eso sí. De todo lo que me pasó, nunca me separé de él. Ya estamos aquí y no lo vamos a separar. Jimmy, él es ciudadano americano. Yo le dije, vamos a correr un riesgo, pero él dijo, mami, juntos, siempre juntos. Y sufrimos, salimos, caminamos, no nos daban jalón, aguantamos hambre, se comía un día. Eh, eh, yo le daba la comida al niño, para no, yo no comía. Y para aguantaba hambre. Sí, me hubiera quedado, pero también, o sea, como las pandillas están, entonces la, la economía se va abajo. Porque como las pandillas están, entonces ya le da miedo a la gente ya trabajar. So as a Central American fleeing their country, once they escape the gangs back home, they are still far from safety. There are countless gangs that control activity around the U.S. border, spanning from California to Texas. The various gangs control who crosses the border, how they cross, and nobody crosses without their permission and steep payment. Many of these gangs have found it more lucrative to kidnap and extort migrants than it is to simply traffic drugs, whether for ransom, forced prostitution, and in many cases, black market organ harvesting, these people are susceptible to horrible violence without mercy. There's an average of around 30,000 persons who, who disappear Nobody knows about them yearly. And 1,250 confirmed kidnappings. In many documented cases, government officials are paid off to help in the capturing of migrants. So when a person gets dropped off into Mexico with very little belongings, they're essentially wounded sheep being dropped off in a wolf's den. The story that's about to be told is heart-wrenching, and at some points difficult to hear and see, but vitally important as he is only one of tens of thousands who have suffered similar fates and haven't lived to talk about it. My name's Efren Galindo Guevara. Efren was born in Mexico, but had lived in the U.S. since he was eight months old. He was deported at age 49 for a DUI he received in the 1980s. Wanting to be with his four American-born children, he attempted to cross back into the U.S. and he was caught, arrested, and dropped off in Mexico at an immigration office. A woman working at the office gave him directions to a nearby shelter. So he thought. She was working with a local gang who targeted him for ransom. Yeah, I can go walk in if you want. It's not too far. I said, okay, so she went in the office, closed the door, and she was on the phone for about five minutes. And we took off walking like 20 minutes later, there was a white truck. The driver had a little tech, a little tech, tech machine gun. The passenger had a dagger. When I took out running, he grabbed me by the neck. He stuck that dagger that he had 
right here. But I felt it all the way inside. I thought that he had already crossed me. And he told me, he goes, Hijo de tu pinche madre, si no guardas silente y suerte en la toca, te voy a sacar la tripa. That means if you, don't, if you don't listen to me, he goes, I'm going to gut your guts right here in front of everybody. And when that was happening, all the people that were right there in their houses, out in the yard, whatever, they all went inside, locked the door, left it by ourselves. Nobody helped us. Anyways, they got us in the truck. When I felt that dagger, in it, I had to give up because he was choking me. I, could, I remember it was hauling ass, passing lights and everything. We got to the ranch. We got to the ranch. Uh, they got off the off the truck to the back door. There's like four guys with machine guns standing there. They're all laughing and asking them, "Onde onde te te estos? Where did you find these at?" So they opened up the, the the lock and they threw us all in there. Inside the room, there was like four covers full of piss and blood, and there was two five gallon buckets where they had you use in the restroom. Two days later, when that happened, they uh they got those with me. They they. Him and his son, they got her the phone. And they threw him in there. They had uh, tienes siete días to hand over the 10 grand. And he got to an argument with her. And uh, the guy pushed him in the room and he told him, fuck off. Two guys went in there and beat the hell out of him. When they beat the hell out of him, I was against the wall. And his head hit me, but hit me in my knee. And I was so fucking pissed off. I grabbed him by his, his uh, right here, behind the scene, I picked him up and I body slammed him. I should have never done that because uh, that other son of a bitch hit me with the, uh, they knocked my teeth out. They knocked out my teeth out with the handle of the, of the gun. And they beat me to where my, all my fucking head was all knotted up. I was knocked out and they cut me. I remember seeing that fucking dagger, the same dagger. And he stuck me right here. He came in there and it came out through here, from the back, and they shot out through there. He cut all this off. He did that to me. They cut off an inch and a half on each side. And I'm a diabetic and I was bleeding and it was full of pus. They couldn't see. We were looking like fucking raccoons. I was like, look what they did to us, man. He goes, they tell him las piernas. That means he hold his legs. And he bent his arm. He bent it all the way to the back. He bent it above my neck in the back and he sliced all my muscle off. I got my muscle missing from here. That's what it did to me. And uh, like on the fifth day, it was my turn to, to make my phone call to call my family. I said, I can't get up. I said, Look what y'all did to me. I couldn't even talk because my mouth, my lips were all cut up and they broke this damn leg right here. They stomped up my leg and they broke my leg, my knee. I couldn't get up and this other sorry son of a bitch came back in there, he grabbed the knife and he stabbed me like four or five times. <laughs> and six days later, I couldn't hear. I'm a diabetic and I couldn't hear. I lost so much blood, my hearing went went away. Uh, like on the seventh day, my, my vision, all the blood I lost, my vision was getting darker and darker and darker and darker. I don't really remember, at four o'clock in the morning I woke up. And I was there, threw me out there in the desert. Efren was eventually rescued on the side of the road, on the brink of death. Even if you survive the gangs at home, you avoid the violence along the journey, you then face the desert. More than 6,500 people have died crossing the desert since 1998. Their primary cause of death, dehydration. Since many of the migrants cross without documentation, their bodies are often never identified. In the back of this quiet graveyard in Southern California, there's a barren field where about 600 men, women, and children rest beneath anonymous tombstones. Nos has favorecido con los dones de muchas culturas y naciones. Líbranos del temor a quienes vienen de otras tierras. Enséñanos a cambio a compartir nuestros dones con los recién llegados para que puedas decir, fui forastero y ustedes me acogieron en su casa. Vengan ahora a mi reino Pedimos esto en tu nombre, desde el Padre, por el poder del Espíritu Santo. Amen. Border Angels brings groups to leave messages on the anonymous brick tombstones of the fallen migrants as a way to show respect to the dead and try to give them some form of a dignified resting place. Several days later, the cemetery management throws them all away. They refuse to speak to us as to why. Even in death, they are separated by a border. 
Right now we are in Southern California at the Mexico-USA border. Today we're working with Border Angels to do one of their water drops with the sole purpose of leaving fresh gallons of water on the common migration path. The reason being is that dehydration is the number one cause of death for immigrants that are making the trek due to the extreme weather in the desert. Their sole purpose is to help people survive. I remember one time when I was with Bill O'Reilly on his show, he said, you're aiding and abetting. And I go, Bill, I've been doing this for more than 30 years. And I can guarantee you that not one person has crossed in the desert for the water. They're crossing simply because they're trying to have some sort of a life. La verdad es que allá te pagan por hora. Ganas mejor, vives mejor. Traté de aventarme por aquí y me rompí un me rompí un tobillo y el otro me lo astillé. Pero te digo que no me quito la idea de, de volver a regresar. A mí me gustaría decir que emigré de mi país porque hay mucha delincuencia y allá bueno, muchos sufren uno, muchos niños andan en la calle y aquí allá en Estados Unidos es muy racista y la gente solo va porque quiere tener un mejor futuro para sus hijos, para poder trabajar, tener sus cosas. The wall doesn't stop anything. It takes 15 seconds to jump over that wall. If there was a 30 foot wall, it would take 35 seconds. That wall does not hold nobody because they got flying objects here. They got submarines here that go straight over there. They got tunnels. They got ladders. There's a parking lot on the other side right there. So they put a ladder for you to cross it. They are victims of foreign migration, you know? So I ask the president of Honduras to please help us. They're threatening their lives and they're not only threatening, they're killing them, man. In any moment, llega una pandilla y empieza a pagar extorsión y nos maten. They don't want to be in that situation. Nobody comes because they want to, they come because they have to. Let's think about that. They believe in the land of the free, you know. Many of them are Americans in, in their minds. I am an American. I'm an American citizen to my grandfather. I am an American, yeah. They believe in the, in the U.S. We cannot blame them. ¿Qué quieres hacer cuando seas grande? Como los inmigrantes. ¿Y por qué? Ah, solo, solo, si, si veo a un inmigrante que se pase, solo hago como que me caiga el teléfono. Immigration in the U.S. is an infinitely complicated topic, and Border Angels themselves tells people to not make the journey. Don't risk your life crossing. Don't do it. But it's easy for me to say it. Are they going to watch their children be killed in front of them? in their home country? Or are they gonna say, I want my child to have a better life? Let's treat people in a humane manner. We wanna have secure borders, but we wanna have intelligent borders. Let's work with our neighbors. Not look down on anybody, but let's see how we can work together. The world will be a better place. They understand that people are going to do it regardless. They're doing everything they can to ensure the safety for people making the journey. So much so that they put themselves in extreme danger. In 2017, while on a volunteer mission, Ugo was kidnapped and held with no demand for ransom. Knowing he was being targeted, he posted this video to his social media as a plea for help. Ugo was kidnapped shortly after posting this video. Hey, necesito ayuda. Estoy aquí con muy poco dinero. No me quieren agarrar dólares y fui agredido por un grupo, un grupo de, de criminales. Estoy aquí cerca, pasando el camino a Puebla. Probably they knew that I was an activist. Uh, a lot of activists have been killed here in Mexico. I thought I was I was going to be killed because they didn't try to contact my family. I didn't know I had two broken ribs at the time, but I, I couldn't breathe. Broken nose, broken skull. I couldn't articulate well. People just thought that I was I was drunk. I couldn't find a, a way to be in contact with my loved ones because I didn't have money. A good Samaritan was able to to believe me in my story and he called my, my family and, and I was I was fun. Even though I have been, I've gone through a lot of pain, physical and psychological damage, I still have that uh, strong thirst of social justice. Hugo has devoted his life to helping migrants who are caught up in a system that doesn't have their backs. 
He was almost killed for doing this, yet he is still doing everything he can to help today. We knew that we wanted to help too, so we donated $500 worth of socks and underwear to the shelter. Also, the shelter has been running a cafe to help employ some of the migrants. However, they're very limited on supplies. So we donated $2,000 for an espresso machine so they can get their business up and running. The best way you can help is by donating to the Border Angels website directly. And of course, by sharing this video. And if you're in Tijuana, stop by the cafe. We are not trying to say what is wrong or right, but what we do know is that every person should have the right to seek safety, freedom, and pursuit of a better life for their children. This problem isn't going away anytime soon, but the least we can do is try to understand the magnitude of the violence and corruption that would force you to leave everything and everyone you love behind. To venture into a foreign country without help, without even a guarantee of safety, but solely with the hope of having just a chance at a better life on the other side of a rusted metal fence. Thank you so much for watching this video and please make sure to subscribe as we'll be posting new documentaries every other week. And if you wanna learn how to support TFIL Films and the Four Sparta organization so we can continue to make more documentaries around the world, please visit our website or support us on Patreon. Thank you guys so much.